the northeast corner, stuck out like a shoulder into the sea. Aberdeenshire and Bath, Peterhead, Fraserburgh, and the Golden Horn. Mechty me when I think of the generations of our folk that have put out to sea past that light. Leaving this harbour in their small boats to the same stormy seas, I and the same smell of fish. Once it was sail, now it's steam drifter and motorboat. So many lives spent as ours have been, tossing about in every weather, searching for fish, hauling fish, landing fish. And now there's my son, going out on his own to fish for himself for the first time. It's a thing he's long wanted, and I've wanted for him. Aye, the fish will look different to him now that he's own. The men on the quayside uh, checked me when they saw I was stopping ashore. Why aren't you going out too, they asked. Oh, I told him, my son's back from the war, let him fish for himself. It's time the younger generation took over. If more of us old men only knew when to stop, there wouldn't be so many of the younger lads in the quayside waiting for our boats. We've had our day, man. And now it's their turn. Let the lads have their chance. have been long, and I've seen the best and the worst of life. I remember the day we moved out of the old cottage in Petuli. Things were good then, and all the fishermen were hoping to make better lives for themselves. We had no regrets leaving the old place. We packed all we had into a truck, and when we drove off, it was like starting out afresh to a new life. And that's the view we are to see now every day of our lives. Big seas and big skies rolling and blowing outside the cottage window. Aye, we'd done well with our boats and that fresh white house down by the shore was a sign of it. But we didn't lose our heads. When fishermen make money, they don't buy fur coats and motor cars. They put it back into their boats and gear, save it against hard times. For the hard times came again. The port wasn't a pretty sight then. Idle boats choking the harbour, breaking up for lack of paint and use. And how could such a thing have happened? We were better at catching fish than we'd ever been. But the more fish we caught, the more prices fell. In the end, many of us hadn't the money to put to sea at all. Maybe we should have tried to make some plan among ourselves to save our trade, but we didn't trust each other enough. We were fair helpless those days, and many a man was forced to scrap his boat and leave it to rot along the sands. Those years were nearly starved, and none of us will ever forget it. It had been every man for himself, and this is where it had brought us. That's how it was. Sometimes good, us often bad. Then the war started and the sea came into its own again. Now it's my son's stuff. The world's still hungry. And when he comes back from a night's fishing, he knows his cuts will be sold at a fair price for food, not manure. He 
these young lads don't want a fortune, but they want to be sure that when they bring in a decent catch, they'll get a decent price for it. And they want to be certain no one in shore is making a fortune out of their losses. They need prices planned and guaranteed like the farmers have already. Well, I've seen all that. The sea, the ports, the fisherman's life. But there's another side to the picture, the land. There's my daughter now. She's married to a farmer chap over the turf. I think I'll pay them a visit for a change. Fishing and farming lie side by side in the northeast corner. But 200 years ago, the land was poor and much of it fed off the sea. In those days, the fishwives climbed up the wind-torn cliffs and carried their herrings far to the hungry country. The land then was wild, choked with peat and bog. It shivered between the mountains and the sea, lying in ruin just as the last great glaciers had left it. Across this barren land, the fishwife toiled among the few small towns and scattered crops, with inhabitants slaves to scratch up poor living from the shallow soil. Penny was hard earned in those days. Wind and stone were the masters here. The few trees that grew, grew to the tortured pattern of the weather. The few men who lived there, lived and died under the cold shadow of the granite. But here and there in this hard land, like an ornament dropped down in the desert, you would find the castle of some great family, a sudden upshoot of trees and towers, a strange contrast to the surrounding poverty and a blessed market for the tramping fishwife and her herring. aching feet of that poor woman. May her old bones rest. The train has taken the fish out of her hands now, for good and all. And it's a different look the land has too, from those withered mosses and hungry moors, tidy fields and comfortable farms wherever you care to look. You'd wonder how folk could work such a change in so short a time. By hard work and mother wit, that's how it was done. This land is made land, all of it, and it's the sweat of man that's made it. When the first farmer came to this country, his first crop was stones. But he turned the hard face of nature to the wall, he drained the bogs and mosses, he laid out the land in fields and ploughed it and brought it under crop. There was such a hunger for land 150 years ago that no part of it was wasted. The soil was ploughed and turned up into the air, was fed, enriched, and husbanded. So, year by year, acre by acre, the face of the land was changed. It was a long, heroic labour, but the reward today is a fertile country of abundant crops and fine pastures wandering with strong black cattle. Farms are not all that man made out of this country. Where the rivers come down from the hills, fed by the drains and ditches our forefathers dug a hundred years ago, the valleys were filled with power. And man took this power to turn the wheels of a hundred mills. There are fewer mills now than there used to be, 
for a few large ones can do the work of many small ones. And today it may be steam or electricity that works the mills. But it's still the dawn water that flows round every process here, turning rags and refuse into clean white paper and rolling it out in sheets as crisp as snow. At Keith, it's the Isla water, and the same water that washes the sheep on the hills washes the wool in the factories. The water here does a hundred jobs. It runs and tumbles about the mills, it spins the thread and works the loom and shrinks the tweeds that are the finest in the world. But the best of all these many waters is the cold, clear stuff that comes down from the melting snows of the mountains and is trapped and held by the distilleries in the valleys. They are taking to itself the spirit of whiskey. Oh yes. A few good things have come out of this once hungry land. Aye, it's been a hard life for both fishers and farmers in those 200 years. But a man cannot change the seas, he can change the land. They've come a long way, these farmers. Anyone can see that. And my son-in-law tells me they must still keep going on. Andrew's a modern chap, schooled in Aberdeen. Farming's a sort of a science to him. First, he takes me up the hill to see his new pastures and his dairy herd. Milk pays better than beef nowadays, he says. And he talks a lot about tuberculin testing and butter, fat and proteins and things that old-fashioned farmers would have thought made decent. Then he shows me his tractors, any amount of them, all over the place. I say to him, man, it's mechanics you need, not plowmen. And he tells me they're the sons of the plowmen that used to be. I mind, I asked him where he kept his horses. Well, there's the stables over there, he says, come and have a look. But there wasn't a horse to be seen, only more tractors coughing and snorting away on rubber wheels and caterpillar tracks, filing off to the fields like an armored division. all over the farm. When I went into the course to see the milking, it was like going into a factory. I suppose that's what farming has got to be nowadays if you want to make a go of it. There were the cows standing snug in white gleaming stalls, as if they were in a beauty parlour. But it wasn't all show. If you have to sell the right kind of milk, you've got to have a place where everything is clean. That's why Andrew built this fine new court. After all, Farmers have got guaranteed prices for years ahead, and that makes the money side of it easier. Eh, but it was a fine show. All the milking done by machinery. The cow just stands there, chewing her cud, while the milk runs up along the pipes and then drops down into a jar to be weighed. And Andrew makes a note of exactly how much each cow gives every day. From the weighing jar, the milk pours out over the cooler, and it's drawn off again, up and along and through a lot more types, till at last it shoots, plop, straight into the bottle. Yes, Andrew's a canny lad, no doubt about it. He's got the farm running like a clock. But, oh, he says, that's nothing. Farming's a modern industry. And to do any good, it's got to be run like one. Yes, whenever I see my daughter, I tell her she did well to marry a farmer. You've got a fine place, I say. It's a credit to you. Well, we didn't win it in a raffle, father, she says. I know that, my girl, I tell her. You've earned it, both of you. Even an old fisherman like me can see farming's no easy life. 
especially up here in the northeast. It's a struggle, and my grandson there will need all his schooling when the time comes for him to take over the farm. But he's a bright lad, and when his father tells him to get on with his homework, he settles down to it, muttering away like a book. The city of Aberdeen is the capital of northeast Scotland. It is situated between the rivers Don and Dee. It has 160,000 inhabitants and is known as the Granite City. The visitor to Aberdeen is well advised to pay a visit to the granite quarry of Rubeslaw, two miles out from the town by bus or tram. This tremendous chasm, 400 feet in depth, is known as the hole Aberdeen came out of. And this description is, in fact, no more than the truth. Yes, Aberdeen was torn out of this hole as if by a giant. The granite blocks, as cold and grey as northern skies, have been carved into the spires and the streets of our city. Aberdeen is hard as they are hard, and it has its own strong, deep-rooted life. Its life is the cultural focus of the whole Northeast. Our university was founded at the end of the 15th century, and for hundreds of years, students from all over Scotland have passed from these walls to become leaders of art and science and industry. There is also fine equipment for agricultural research at the Macaulay and Rowett Institute and at the Duffy Stock Farm. We have a training college for teachers, a college of agriculture and a divinity school, and there's a fishery research station too out at Torrey. In fact, education is such an industry here that it might be true to say that one of Aberdeen's chief exports is educated men and women. On the other hand, speaking as a medical man, it might be said that our chief exports are doctors. <clears throat> and tombstones, or so I'm told. And it's a good place to live in. Noisy, but nice. Aye, and friendly, too. There are plenty of good shops and no long queues. New, no for fish, anyway. And concerts and picture galleries. Oh, there's always something to do or look at here. And the sound of trams and horses rattling through the granite streets is something you always remember about Aberdeen. Yes, and if a farmer wants a good market, he comes to Aberdeen. Short horns in Aberdeen, Angus, Lister and down lambs, store cattle, dairy cows. Aye, aye, you'll get the best that's going here. The city has a port designed to handle deep sea trawling and is one of the chief centers of the white fishing industry in the British Isles. Principal imports are coal, fertilizers, feeding stuffs, timber, esparto grass and wool. Exports, meat, grain, potatoes, paper, tweed, curry, and whiskey. The shipyards around the port build trawlers, drifters and small cargo vessels for the coastal trade and for export. Though not a large industry, it is important in the life of the city. One of the things I like best of a table bean is the warm sandy beach. Almost the last thing you'd expect to find among all this granite. It's a proper holiday place in the right weather. Bathing and side shows, pop and ice cream, oh yes. Aberdeen's fun, if you can't far to look for it. McTavish was fight major in the Highlands Cod Brigade and proudly led the regiment when it was on parade. He loved the bonny lassie and before he went away she sold a little keepsake so he'd think on her each day. T'was the tourie on his bonnet, the red tourie on it, the red tourie ori ori He left his kilt and sparring and off he went to war in his red tourie ori ori And when swinging into action he's the centre of attraction He's the pride of Bonnie Scotland, so they say. In the darkness, the granite sleeps. The lamps in the streets soften the hard edges of the town, and the harbour lies down with its ships. But the sea never sleeps, and the long, sharp headlands, rinsing their teeth in the cold green waves, are watched every hour and minute of the darkness by this steady, sliding light.
The light and I watch together. For what has an old man to watch and haver of things past? And watching, I've learned a lot about my country, this cold northeast corner of Scotland that bears us on its shoulder like children above the sea.